Hello, good morning. I have the privilege of uh, kicking things off today uh, with a topic that I feel very passionate about. Uh, so hopefully we, we go through this and pick up some nuggets. What I want to do over the next 20 minutes is take you through some very specific examples that we have in PNG of how we have used qualitative research to bring winning with shoppers to life. So we have a very strong principle that the consumer is boss. And specifically, what this will be about is how we win with the consumer when the consumer is in the store. Uh, so my, my initial uh, picture shows, I think, the end state that uh, all of us want to get to. We are very competitive, uh, sort of excellent people. So we want to win. Uh, and this is about how we use research to win with our business. A couple of uh, preliminary context slides uh, to set the tone on why we do this and why we think it's relevant. First, uh, this one we all feel. So even when you go in the morning and get a cup of coffee, it takes you six or seven decision points to get to what type of product you want to get, right? Uh, and it's no different in the store. So in an FMCG environment where we operate in, it's the same. We see this all the time. We see both multinationals and local players launching SKUs, launching new variants, and retailers also doing the same with their house brand. So consumers are bombarded with choices, right? I think people are very familiar with the concept of the long tail where even if there are very few people who want a particular item, it tends to exist and there is some space for it in the store. So first point is today, the world we live in is one where consumers are bombarded with choices. When they do go to the store, uh, either brick and mortar or even online retail. The, and standing out therefore in the store becomes much more important than ever. That is the first point. Uh, what we have increasingly found uh, in the industry and within PNG is a shifting research paradigm given, given this complexity and the bombardment of choices. Previously, traditional research, both quantitative as well as qualitative, tends to focus on uh, both the product, so they have a winning product, what is the need that is being met, as well as the advertising or the above the line communication that goes into how you talk to your consumer. What we have increasingly found is given that environment, that is not enough. So today, what we see is an increasing need for us to also understand how to win when the shopper is in the store, when the decision will actually get made. And we feel that a lot of decisions, at least in the industry that we compete in, in our categories, the decisions do get made at the store. Uh, so the research previously on just uh, media and product is not enough. And so it's important to also look at uh, what happens in the store. And the shift is to include that in the whole research bucket of what we try to understand uh, in order to win with shoppers. So that's a, a couple of context slides to set the tone for three of the specific cases that I wanted to go through and share with the team today. So what I'll be going through are three very simple questions, and they're cases specific to each that bring to life uh, how we have answered those questions in the context of winning with shoppers. And it flows uh, in a sequence from the first to the second to the third. So first is understanding qualitatively what does your shopper think about your brand. Second is how does shopping fit in her daily life. So outside of just what happens, before the person even gets to the store, what is the relevance and what is the role of your brand, of your category to that person. And then the last is how does she actually behave during her shopping. So when was the last time that we went around and actually walked in the shoes alongside or with the shopper or the consumer that we want to target. So these are the three questions that I'll go through, and I'll tackle specific cases where we try to address each of them uh, in our business. So the first one I wanted to talk about is what we call a multi-brand program. Uh, so I work on the ASEAN and Philippines markets for PNG. PNG in the Philippines has a very long heritage. Uh, it is the third, subsid the second subsidiary in the world, the third site for Procter and Gamble. We've been there for 75 years, so there's a lot of heritage. Uh, for PNG in the Philippines. What we wanted to do was find a program that cut across the different brands since we had been there for such a long time. Uh, we did and went the research. We talked to consumers in home. We talked to them in the store. We tried to understand what they thought of our brands. Uh, and what we came up with was a program that we call Istojante. Uh, Istojante is actually the Filipino term for student, and it plays on E for e-commerce or electronic. So the program that we had, and I'll talk about the insight that led to it in a bit, uh, is essentially that we wanted to donate laptops to public schools. 
so what we saw was the perception that our consumers had for PNG brands across the board, so Safeguard, Tide, Ariel, etc., were that these brands were very helpful to them in their role as mothers in the household. And for a lot of the consumers that we had, especially on the more affluent ones, where they, they were more concerned on giving back to society, they saw that these brands give back. Uh, and they wanted to be able to demonstrate that. So the program that we had was to uh, donate laptops to public schools. And the way that we funded it was to have a very direct program whereby if they buy a certain set of PNG products uh, that had the same equity or the same perception as what you're trying to drive, a percentage of it goes directly to the fund that gives laptops to public schools. Uh, and what we did was to commercialize this. Uh, so there's a copy which I won't show uh, today, but we had a copy on this and we communicated it above the line and we worked with the Department of Education to give this. So the idea was one pack gives one child a brighter future and there is a glide path to be able to provide laptops to all the public schools uh, in the Philippines. Uh, what we also did crucially was to commercialize this in the store. So given that what we saw was shoppers make the decision once they are in front of the shelf, we made sure that the communication does not stop either with the above the line or with external relations type of activities. So even in the store, either in the packs themselves where it was communicated or in the displays or other types of shelving where it comes to life, this was something that we tried to bring out. So what was the insight that we had going through that research that led to this? Uh, the research, the insight was very simple, which is that shoppers think of PNG brands as beneficial to their households in the broader community. And what we wanted to do was create that sense of affinity, given that it was a common idea cutting across brands and then translating it down. Uh, so this has been a very successful program which uh, we are doing in the Philippines, which drives both the brand equity as well as driving a social good for the immediate community where the business operates in. So it's a, a straightforward example on how we use research and understanding what is common across brands and trying to create a program out of it. Uh, so what I also wanted to do was highlight some possible applications and delve a bit into the research that goes into this and how this might be applicable in your specific projects, cases, or businesses, even outside of the FMCG industry. So two or three possible applications. The first is looking for portfolio play across brands. So one of the interesting things that we saw was even across product categories that intuitively did not seem like they were very clearly related. Uh, so for example, between a diapers category and a fabric softener category, even if intuitively they might be used in different instances during the day, what we saw was a strong brand like Pampers and another strong brand like Downey actually have very similar equities that cut across between them. In this case, it was making the life easier for the mom and again, that was how uh, the brand was allowing the mom to help the kids and then translate that on a broader basis to, to uh, society. So uh, the possible application is really understanding what is common in the way that your shoppers perceive your brands. And shoppers here might even be online, uh, depending on what category you are in. It might be in the store, but it's going a level deeper or peeling the onion and seeing what might be common even if they're different categories. Uh, as, as we did in this case. A second possible application, I alluded to it earlier when I said that PNG in the Philippines had been there for 75 years, uh, is leveraging corporate heritage and scale. So for a company like PNG, we don't always communicate PNG. Uh, previous to this and previous to other executions, it tended to be more on the specific brands. But what we saw was that uh, shoppers and consumers do have an awareness on the corporate branding and the corporate equity. So sometimes we get lost uh, in the specific trees working on uh, individual product items. When you zoom out and see the forest, consumers are smart enough and shoppers are smart enough to make the link and actually see that there is something that's broader that you can bring to them. So look at what is there on corporate heritage and scale. And crucially, when you work with retailers or other partners, how can you work with them to jointly bring this to life? Uh, so in the earlier example, in the displays and the shelving, it works both ways uh, because we work with retailers to design and get that space. But on the other hand, we also drive offtake for those stores because it's a meaningful new product that their shoppers would like. 
Uh, and then the last one is assessing evolving consideration set uh, factors. So is there a new vector that is causing your brand maybe to lag behind or your competition might be doing better off? Uh, so in this case, it was social responsibility. And that's what we found when we did the qualitative research. So within a set of shoppers uh, that are slightly more affluent, are more exposed to CSR type programs, it was very relevant to them. And that is something that you don't uh, get as easily with uh, quantitative. It's peeling the onion and trying to understand what are the other concerns or drivers that they have. Yeah. Uh, the next uh, specific case that I wanted to get to is on understanding how the product fits in the context of the life of the shopper uh, or the consumer. So some context on this one. Uh, in the Philippines, we have around 1 million traditional stores. So think of these as mom and pop type stores. Uh, we call them sari-sari stores. So in the Philippines, these 1 million stores buy both from our distributors as well as from wholesalers. Uh, and what we wanted to do in this particular project was to understand what is the process when they actually buy from wholesalers, wherein we have slightly less control because uh, it isn't through distributors uh, that we sell to them. So the research tool that we did here was uh, essentially a total shopping journey, which is going through with the shopper across all the steps. So starting from the home, to going to the store, to the early part in the store, middle part, checkout, and transit. Uh, so what we did was meet with our shoppers. So in this case, they were the mom and pop type uh, traditional store owners. And then we went with them right when they were at home. And we found out insights like, these guys are very smart. So they will not go to the store not knowing what to buy. Uh, so in some cases, the decision for these types of shoppers are actually made even before they go to the store. So it is a preset list that they have, uh, which they go and bring with them. And uh, the key, therefore, might be not just to have very strong presence in the store, but actually to make sure that you are on the list before they even go to the store. So is there some way to partner with the wholesaler so you have a preset template uh, where your branding is more prominent than other brands, right? So it's a very qualitative type of insight that you see by observing the shopper even before the shopper gets to the store. Uh, and in this case, of course, it's very important for the shopper because the, the owner of the traditional store will have very limited capital. So the list plays a very important part. And oftentimes, the list even has prices uh, associated with it, with, with the specific items. Uh, we went around with the shoppers, so even going around literally in uh, what the, we call tricycles uh, or cabs attached to motorcycles, and also seeing if there are opportunities to remind them as they go to the wholesaler. And then once we went into the store, uh, that's where we also started seeing what did the shopper see when they went in. So for example, uh, in this particular picture, one of the initial hypotheses that we had was you needed to have branding in the bigger part of uh, the store right before you enter. So essentially like a header board uh, that you see over there in that photo. But what we saw was if you look at the shopper, the shopper actually doesn't look at what's there above. So the shopper looks straight through. Uh, and therefore, the investment uh, that we had, and I think in some cases, those are actually uh, our brands that are there might not have been the best use of investment because the shopper doesn't see it. It might feel good for management to walk by and see that the branding is there and uh, uh, the team did a great job getting the excellent branding, but from the standpoint of the shopper, it was as good as irrelevant because the shopper is in a hurry to go inside the store. right? So that was an example of something you see via tailing the shopper and seeing what is the actual behavior uh, in the store. Similarly, we went through uh, all of the aisles within that wholesaler to see what was the behavior uh, of this particular shopper. And we looked at things like, what is the more effective communication? So is it more effective when you say that more uh, traditional store owners are buying it? Is it more effective if you use the communication that you make X percent margin from the product? And these types of things, often, you don't even need to create a formal test for. Right? So you don't even need to create different concepts and present them to a broad base and try to get the quantitative score of each concept. Some of the time, what you can do is in market, see what appeals to them and try to understand why or why not a particular concept appealed or didn't appeal to them. 
So things like that are, you un are, are what we tried to understand in the mid-journey. Again, going to uh, the store with the shopper, with the traditional store owner. Uh, in this particular case, one of the other things that we saw was that at checkout, things were very chaotic. Uh, and I think this it's a very small picture, but if you blow it up, you will get a sense of uh, the chaos that happens because wholesalers are also very smart businesses, right? Uh, they are very high volume, low margin transactions. They don't invest a whole lot in the aesthetics or in the wide layout uh, of the store because where they make money from is bulk purchases from the back room. Uh, so what we saw was, from a retailer standpoint, it made sense to them, right? Because why will I invest in uh, more checkout counters in broader space when my business is bulk buying from the back? But what we saw was, even if there was bulk buying from the back, the line that goes in and what they bought once they went through the store is still a very big part of the shopper journey. In fact, if uh, not to call it a time motion study per se, but for a lot of these uh, traditional store owners, they actually went and uh, spent almost an hour there, right? So it was a very long process. Uh, and then lastly on transit, uh, same as uh, the previous one, we go back to the store and see, go back to the house and see what happens there. So the inside is seeing how the trip affects the in-store behavior. I'm told they have around five minutes, so I'll breeze through the possible applications. Uh, one is identifying behaviors that you can anchor on. So what rituals does your shopper have, like the list, before leaving the house? Uh, second and third, what can you do to bring, your to bring your brand to the forefront of the store in a relevant way? And then the last is, how do you strengthen the brand equity even after purchase? Uh, so is there some after-sale program that you can do to remind the shopper? The last one is on baby solution centers. So in this particular case, what we did was work with a major retailer and see how can they create the best adjacencies among different product categories. What you see here on the left is what their initial uh, layout was in the store. And it made sense because baby diapers might have been near other paper products, uh, lotion might have been near other baby products, powdered milk might have been near adult milk. So it made sense to them. But what we saw was when you went around with the shopper, who more often than not was a young mom, the orienting factor was actually not herself, the orienting factor was the baby. So what we saw was that it made much more sense to clump all of these categories together in a baby solution center, because that is the orienting factor for the shopper, right? And these things you don't see as often with quantitative. You have to go through the store and actually go around with your shopper. So the insight was the baby needs was the primary consideration for the Pareto shopper or the shopper that had the bigger basket size for that retailer. So again, just some possible applications for this. One is challenging assumptions on store behavior. So the retailer in some cases might think they understand the shopper. In some cases they do. In some cases you might be able to help them. Uh, second one is how do you enable win-win solutions? Uh, so I talked about this in the multi-brand concept. Similarly, how do you grow their sales while growing a relevant category for you? So in our case, it was diapers, but also increasing sales in milk and lotion and other adjacencies. The last one is do not be afraid to create disruptive solutions. So what can you change in the store environment to make them feel better? In some cases, it might require an investment, like the baby solution center will require dressing up and rearrangement and all of these things. But what can you do to ultimately make the experience better? Because the consumer is the boss, the shopper is the boss. Right? So those were three very specific cases that I wanted to share today on how to win with shoppers. Uh, just as an ending for the last minute or two, uh, as some key takeaways from all that I tried to cover today. Uh, one is winning with the shopper is the last and most important step of winning the market. So for a lot of our brands, a lot of our categories, you win or lose based on what happens in the store whether you get bought or not. Second is understanding human behavior, not just consumer behavior, in some cases not just shopper behavior, will ultimately be the key to winning in the market. So all of the contextualization that I was saying in all three cases, try to bring this to life. Human behavior, not just consumer or shopper behavior. And then the last one is, especially in the latter two examples, walking in the shoes of your shopper, unlocks the winning insight. So there's still no better substitute than either being the shopper or uh, at least being as close to the shopper when the journey happens. Uh, so that's essentially what I had today. Uh, so thank you for uh, being a very attentive audience to, to this first session. Thank you. I have a question that 
should we focus on the corporate brand or should we focus in the product brand? Uh, my finding was uh, when I was uh, in my uh, other company, when I was for a research, uh, working for a research agency, we were doing something for the Lux. And we have found nobody recalls, my, very few percent of people recall that Lux is a product of Unilever. So there is a there was a dilemma. Uh, in that case, what we need to do? No, that's a very great point. Uh, and to be honest, it's a point that I think manufacturers still struggle with. And you see that based on the allocation of how much goes into corporate branding, how much goes to individual brands. Two or three things off the top of my head. One is I think it also varies on the competitive landscape and what category you are in. So in somewhere in there are more brands and stronger brands in that category. Maybe the specific product brand becomes more important. In some places where competition is not as strong and you want to drive category growth, maybe you latch on to the corporate branding because you're trying to grow the category or change uh, consumer behavior. The other part that I would say is it also varies based on the maturity of the brand or category you are in. Uh, so, for example, if you want to establish the identity of that particular brand early on and there's nothing to go back to, uh, then maybe you start with the branding. But uh, the short answer is I think it will vary from case to case, but both are important. So, in this particular case, even on the multi-brand execution that I shared with you, specific copy for each of the brands obviously would still have been running. So, you still build the brand equity. And then the corporate one is more an on top uh, to halo down to each of the specific brands. But it's a great question to struggle with that I don't think we'll be able to, to nail uh, at least uh, within this session. Maybe later on we'll be able to get some specific answers. But thank you for the question. You said there's about a million Sarasari stores yes. in the Philippines. Um, and they're, they're going shopping regularly to stock, to build their stock for their have you thought about doing some kind of loyalty scheme whereby each time they would go back and they would get a discount if they keep buying your products? Because if there's so many stores, you could do a some kind of loyalty scheme that would then force, well, drive them towards buying your product more. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. So one of the other things uh, that I wasn't able to put down there and coming out of that whole work was uh, when I was making the point on how you communicate back even after. Or, or before, a big part of it is the loyalty program. So a lot of the wholesalers have started doing that exactly because of the point that you were saying, which is they replenish frequently. And what you want to make sure is there is loyalty both to that wholesaler or that uh, replenishment point as well as to your brand. So you co-develop that program with the wholesaler, but that's exactly spot on a phenomenon that we're seeing now uh, in the market, yeah. You mentioned that the shoppers always do a list. So what I was interested in is knowing if they buy sometimes additional things or they just stick to their list? Uh, I would say that around 80 to 85% of their basket at the end uh, of the purchase will be exactly what's there on the list, down to the variant, down to the SKU size. There will be cases where they buy on top. Uh, it's less of an impulse buy because it's not for them, it's for the store. Uh, but there are instances when they do that, either if it's a new product uh, and it gets communicated in the store that, hey, this is new, this has support above the line, etc. Or the other one is if there is some deep promotion that is on that particular product. So it might not be the best selling product, but because the margin uh, for that item will be higher because of the deep discount at that time when they went to the store, they buy it. But my, my estimate around 85% is based on the list that they have. 